and two hind fins or pelvic fins. These uh, traits get modified in some of the fish populations and we think that the presence or the absence of the hind fin is actually a very interesting sort of trait because it's the same kind of trait that's evolved repeatedly in a whole range of different animals. Of course, snakes and some reptiles uh, have evolved major limb reduction. They've lost both their forelimbs and hind limbs. Whales and uh, some aquatic mammals like um, manatees have evolved hind limb reduction. They still retain four fins or flippers, but they've lost uh, the hind fin. And pelvic or hind fin reduction also occurs both in fossil sticklebacks and uh, in some living populations. Again, uh, in those special populations that have decided to lose their hind fin, it's thought to be uh, a likely adaptation uh, to particular predator environments. If you're a fish that's evolving in an environment where there aren't any trout trying to eat you, so you don't need the, uh, to erect spines to try to avoid a trout, but you are being uh, chased by insects, it may actually be good to lose some of these uh, structures uh, that the predators try to grab onto. So I'll show you a little bit higher resolution look at the hind fin of a stickleback uh, in this short video. This is a three-dimensional reconstruction of the stickleback skeleton uh, created by Craig Miller in my lab based on uh, a micro uh, x-ray approach. You can see the armor plates that we talked about before along the sides of this marine fish. And then colored in red, you can see the pelvic apparatus, which consists of this spine that projects from the side of the animal. Uh, it articulates in a ball and socket joint with this underlying pelvic structure, which is shown in red, wrapping around the side and on the ventral surface of the fish. The fish can actually raise and lower those spines. Uh, that's, so then the, the pelvic fin consists of the spine and this underlying uh, pelvic bone. Marine fish always have the pelvis, the form shown at the top pelvis highlighted in red in the middle. But again, some of the freshwater populations uh, have evolved the complete elimination of, uh, of the hind fin, like the Paxton Lake uh, shown at the bottom. So what is the genetic basis of completely losing a limb uh, in natural populations? Again, we can use exactly the same sort of genetic archaeology approach, measuring now uh, the presence or the absence of the hind fin in these crosses between marine and freshwater fish. When you do that, it turns out, and we get a result that should be uh, now sounding familiar, there's a single major gene that maps to the distal end, this time of linkage group 7, that controls about two-thirds of the variation uh, in pelvic size in the F2 progeny from this sort of cross. Once again, it's not uh, Mendelian, so there are a series of chromosomes that have smaller quantitative effects and control maybe 5 to 10 percent of the variation uh, in pelvic size. So again, more complicated than Mendel, but even the presence or absence of an entire uh, limb or fin here is being controlled by a relatively simple uh, genetic system, just as we saw before for major transformations uh, in both corn and in dogs. So I think it is amazing what can be done by simply selecting and accumulating uh, genetic variants. Artificial selection has transformed Tiacente into maize and transformed uh, wolves into a diversity of different dog breeds. But natural selection can generate equally large changes in completely wild animals that are adapting to the kinds of environmental changes that occur all the time uh, in the history of the Earth. So one of the conclusions of this sort of uh, genetic work is that it doesn't take that long to generate uh, really major changes in plants and animals. So all of the changes that we've talked about have been generated uh, in the last 10,000 years or so. That's just a blink of the eye compared to the long geological eras that uh, Sean summarized in, in, in the first lecture. So how uh, can things go so fast? Part of the answer is that single genes have big effects, right? So we saw that for uh, the genes that control the fruit cases in corn or the branching pattern in corn or the leg length uh, in dogs. So those are all examples of artificial selection. Exactly the same thing we've seen uh, in some of the genetic analysis of natural selection. So major genes that control armor plate numbers or uh, presence or absence of a hind fin, or in the case that Sean mentioned this morning, uh, whether you're a black or a light-colored uh, rock pocket mouse, another example of natural variation. The other thing that helps the speed is that it doesn't take very long for selective pressures to increase the frequency of an advan advantageous allele once the mutation has occurred, even at random. Sean showed you this morning that that's true for the case of coat colors uh, in pocket mice. 
1%, 5% selective advantage, and pretty soon, whatever the gene is that controls that trait spreads rapidly uh, through the population. I think that's likely to be true not just for coat colors, but for a whole range of different traits. I think one of the striking things about the sticklebacks is that all sorts of things have changed in the last 10,000 years. Skeletal traits, feeding traits, traits related to mating and reproduction and whether fish are even compatible uh, to mate with each other. All sorts of physiological differences and behavioral differences. So I think that the principles that Sean outlined this morning, how one gene could sweep to produce a color change uh, in a thousand years or less, is actually an example of selection that's occurring for multiple traits simultaneously, even in natural environments. There's all kinds of challenges out there uh, in the changing world, and the process variants that are best adapted to a given environment can do remarkable things to animals and in a time scale that's completely compatible with the needs of the animals uh, to uh, adapt to different environments. So I'll stop there and I'd be happy to take uh, more questions. Yeah. Um, I actually had a question about um, what you had mentioned earlier about the dog breeders. Yeah. Um, well, when you're creating dogs for beauty, what would happen if these dogs were not used for domestic purposes anymore and then they were placed out in the wild, would they go extinct because they've not evolved like the wolf has to adapt to such an environment? Or how would that work? It's a great question. What would happen if the dog breeds were released in the wild? And this is actually uh, it's an interesting question because one of the old arguments about whether artificial selection was relevant to the way evolution would work is a lot of people said, well, if you release those dogs in the wild, you know, they'd be toast, right? I mean, the, uh, and therefore the kinds of genetic architectures that underlie the major changes that humans have been able to achieve aren't relevant for the kinds of genetic mechanisms that might underlie a process of natural selection to change an environment. So I think that's one of the things that's so striking about the stickleback results. There's no humans involved in trying to sculpt these organisms to adapt to these new post-glacial lakes. And yet if you go in and use exactly the same sort of genetic archaeology methods to try to investigate what kinds of genetic changes underlie those differences, in fact, the architectures are, in many ways, surprisingly similar. That you could get major genes that uh, have uh, substantial effects on huge, uh, huge structures, and I think that uh, that shows the power of what genes can do and the power of what selection can do by acting on those genes. Yeah. Uh, isn't it possible with all the, like the constant F1 crosses that, like with like the dogs, the maize, and the sticklebacks that um, the, the results will be affected by inbreeding because you, you're you assume that you're breeding the same, like the children from the same parents, over and over. Question is whether you get inbreeding effects when you do these sorts of crosses, and you can. So there are uh, recessive mutations that can be present in populations, as Sean said. Mutations occur randomly, so during the replication of DNA, you'll get errors. Those uh, sometimes are uh, not apparent unless uh, the genes. The same uh, mutation is on both chromosomes, so they may have occurred originally on one, but when you start to inbreed, you bring those uh, mutations together. So that absolutely uh, can be seen, uh, uh, inbreeding, um, inbreeding effects that, uh, that plague, plague breeders because you have to find the stuff that you want amidst the stuff that, um, that, that you might not want. And I think what that really serves to emphasize is something that came up also in the questions this morning. The process of mutation itself is random. It's not that the corn or the Tiacente knew what corn should look like or that the dog breeders um, were able to pick pre-existing uh, traits that had already varied in the way that, that somebody wanted to have happen. The mutations occur at random. They can be advantageous. They can be disadvantageous. What selection does is it screens. The ones uh, that are bad are eliminated. The ones that are good can be chosen either by a human breeder or by the process of a mutation having a 1 or a 5 or a 10% advantage in overall survival or, uh, or reproduction. Uh, we'll take one uh, in, the, in the red shirt. <laughs>